So this uh, topic is going to study the uh, animal basic body structure and how animals uh, use that structure to help regulate. And what's meant by regulating is to make sure that the internal conditions are kept in balance or homeostasis. So the first section is an overview of, um, of the organization of the vertebrate body. So here we're going to look at the different levels of organization. And your objectives here are to list uh, the levels of organization in the vertebrate body and to identify uh, the tissue types found in vertebrates. So for a vertebrate animal, um, which is a group we belong to, of course, you can go lower than uh, this level of molecules, but we start at cells, which are made of biomolecules. A bunch of cells that are organized together, very similar with the same, a uh, similar function would be called tissues. For example, a muscle cell makes muscle tissue. And then two or more tissues are organized to make an organ like a stomach, uh, for example, or even a muscle like in your arm or your leg, that's an organ. Uh, it's more than just muscle tissue. There's connective tissue and so on. Uh, so those are, those would be organs. And then uh, organ systems, uh, which uh, would be like your digestive, respiratory. And then one step higher than that is the entire organism, the vertebrate animal. So there are levels of organization higher than this. These are levels that have been covered in prior topics with you. So we're going to focus on these levels here within this section and then see how they work uh, together. Uh, to regulate and maintain this homeostasis, uh, homeostatic balance. Now, uh, bodies of vertebrates are composed of different kinds of cells that go through differentiation. We all start off as a zygote, and that zygote has every gene in the animal genome, whether it's a human animal or a dog or a, or a, a bird, which are all vertebrates, which we, we're looking at different topics. Humans, for example, have over 200 cell types, and they all have the same information. But how do they get? How do you get different cell types? Is through uh, differentiation and development. The cells uh, basically get programmed to turn on a specific set of genes that then uh, are are going to be used to regulate what the cell looks like and how it behaves. Uh, so when we look at tissues, uh, tissues as a definition, these are going to be groups of cells that are similar in structure and function. Uh, there's three, we were looking at uh, defining animals in, uh, when we're looking at protostomes and deuterostomes, and protostomes and deuterostomes were all animals that belonged to a group called the bilateria, which have bilateral symmetry. And all bilaterians have, early in their embryonic development, they form these three embryonic tissues, the endoderm, uh, the mesoderm and the ectoderm. Remember that the mesoderm is the one that defines the body cavity. Uh, a true body cavity would be completely enclosed in mesoderm uh, uh, tissues that are derived from mesoderm. And then remember, mesoderm makes things like uh, muscle and skeleton when it comes to um, a, um, a vertebrate uh, embryo. Uh, but all these three embryonic tissues very early in the embryo end up going through more development. The cells in there go through more differentiation. And eventually we're gonna get the four primary mature tissues that come from these tissues. And these tissues include epithelial, which uh, can be formed from any of those three connective tissues, muscle, which comes from mesoderm, and then nervous tissue. So these are the four primary tissues. And then within these tissues, there can be subtypes. So remember that tissues uh, are groups of cells like this muscle cell here. This is a cardiac muscle cell. It's different than skeletal muscle cell. And we put a whole bunch of cardiac muscle cells together. Then we got cardiac muscle tissue. And then we have the organ, the heart. And then the heart, along with the blood vessels, belong to the circulatory or cardiovascular system. So we're looking at these levels of organization. Organs are composed of different tissue types, at least two different tissue types, and then organ systems. And the organ systems are made of uh, different organ types, like the digestive system is the muscle, the, the stomach, the uh, small intestine, large intestine, the, the esophagus, it takes food down to your stomach. Uh, 
So the organs are going to cooperate overall to provide an overall function for that uh, system, like the cardiovascular system for circulation. All right, and so and there are 11 uh, organ systems that we see uh, generally, and they all cooperate again to maintain this balance overall for the animal to help keep it alive. So this section covers the first of the primary tissues, um, the epithelial tissue. And your first learning outcome is to describe the structure and the function of an epithelium, and then to illustrate the cell types found in epithelial tissues, and then to compare the structure and function of different epithelia. So what are epithelia? Well, first of all, epi means at the surface. Okay. So basically, this uh, term describes the fact that epithelia are found to cover surfaces, the surface of your body, your skin. The surface of organs inside you are all covered with this. And if your organs are hollow, they're going to line the internal surfaces of there. So uh, say if you, if you were to take a... Uh, say the small intestine which is an organ, the outside of the intestine would be covered with an epithelium, and so would the inside. The inside is hollow. Uh, so in there, lining the inside would also be an epithelium, and those are surfaces. And the wall of the intestine itself, there's tissues that are in the wall, inside of the epithelia, which is on both on the outside and lining the inside cavity. Uh, so that's a key thing to identify an epithelium. Does it cover a surface? Now, epithelia does come from the three germ layers. So epithelia is derived from both ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. The epithelia is also going to uh, help form glands, glands that secrete things like sweat or hormones. Uh, some key features of epithelia besides being found at the surface is that they are tightly bound together. And that means little very little extracellular space, let's say little, little or no at all, extracellular, which means on the outside of the cell. So that's going to be different than uh, what we see with uh, the next uh, major tissue, which is connected tissue. There's going to be a lot of extracellular space uh, here. So with this tightly bound cells that make up the epithelial cells that make up the epithelial tissue, this is basically going to provide a protective layer which regulates what gets into or out of the cell. Some other features or, or should I say, uh, characteristics of epithelial cells. So let's say some other features, other characteristics. Uh, they don't have blood vessels. These are at the very surface, so they're going to get a, uh, oxygen and nutrients. they got to be from the tissues underneath it, and the nutrients and oxygen would diffuse from the deeper tissues where there are blood vessels up there uh, to the epithelia. So that's referred to as avascular. Vascular for vessels or blood vessels and like cardiovascular system, and A without. Um, they are innervated, though, and that means they have nerve endings which means this tissue can respond to stimuli and uh, uh, is basically communicating with your nervous system. And they have a polarity to them. If the epithelial tissue, which is made of epithelial cells, is at the surface, then that means one side of the tissue is attached to deeper tissues and the other side is free. The free side is called the apical side. And the... Uh, attached side is called the basal side, like the base, the like the base of it. Okay, so there's the apical surface at the top, and the basal surface. Okay? So there's a polarity to that. So these are all some features of epithelial tissues. Now, because the epithelial tissues are found at surfaces, they can get damaged a lot. So they have to have a remarkable ability to regenerate and repair themselves. Uh, and so um, that's the case. Now, I mentioned that because these are at the surface of the epithelial tissues, they have to be attached to uh, the underlying tissues, and they're always going to be attached with the help of connective tissues, which we'll cover later. Uh, and these connective tissues are fibrous, which means they have, a, uh, they have protein fibers associated with them. Now, the, the key here is, and there's two kinds here, this is the surface of one, this is the surface of another, so this is a, a very thin, flat layer of cells, of epithelial cells. Some cells are bigger, larger, they're going to be more column-shaped. 
but both the top of these pictures here are the free side. The bottom side is going to be attached, and they're going to be attached by a membrane called uh, the basement membrane. You should write this down. And the basement membrane is formed by both the epithelial tissue above and below there's connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue below. The tissue below and the epithelial tissue above are going to secrete materials that make that basement membrane, which helps glue the epithelium to it. So I mentioned earlier on the prior slide, the attached surface is the basal surface, and the free surface is the apical surface, and that gives this tissue a polarity, the free side and the attached side. Okay. Uh, so here you go here. If, if we look at this tissue from the surface, the cells are going to look, they're, they're not going to be perfectly round. They're going to be very variably shaped. But if we section it through the organ that this tissue surrounds, this tissue is part of organs that line, that line the surface of these organs, and you section through it, you can see when you look at the side view of that section, in cross section we would call it. So looking from the top would be the whole view of it, all of it, and then cross section. I just drew a little arrow right here where the basement membrane would be, and there's only one layer of epithelial cells. Okay. This would be the apical surface. We're looking at it from, say, if we were swimming around in the digestive fluids and we look uh, down at the surface, there's a brush border here with microvilli, that creates surface area for absorption. This is in the intestine. What I want you to notice, though, is that between the cells, there's very little space. These cells are tightly joined with special junctions that we learned in our Biology 1 class in the cell chapter called tight junctions. And what that does is it prevents any fluids and things dissolved in there from just sinking through there and getting to uh, the deeper tissues where the blood vessels are. Uh, so remember, the epithelial tissue has no blood vessels. All right, so other things, the, the, the cells need to be tightly bound together uh, for stretching and pulling that can tear them apart, and that involves tight junction, uh, not tight junction, sorry, uh, desmosomes, which is another kind of cell junction. And then you may have gap junctions where there's a lot of materials to flow between the cells within that tissue. So there were three major junctions that were studied back like in Chapter 4, the one on cells uh, in 1406 class. So uh, we can classify epithelia based on some features. One is how many layers. Um, so layered, there's two general uh, classes of epithelia based on layer. They're simple, which is one layer. And then they're stratified, which is several layers. And then we can subdivide these two types of layered uh, epithelium and, and name them. And when we classify them, we also name them. Uh, so if the cells are flat, then they, they would be called squamous cells. So it would be a squamous epithelium. If they're cube-shaped, it would be cuboidal and then uh, columnar. So when we're looking over here at this prior image, this would be squamous. And it would be one layer, so it's simple squamous. Over here, we have column-shaped cells. Uh, and there's only one layer, so this would be columnar, but it would be a simple columnar epithelium. Uh, and then there, there's no example of cuboidal, but I'll show you a picture of that in a bit. So where do we find some of these? There's a real nice diagram here that shows uh, where you can find them, same as the information uh, that you see here. Keep in mind some of the things that are mentioned here are in that other chart, like goblet cells, which secrete mucus found in typically in columnar types. So let's take a look at these here. Here we're looking at the tissue from the surface, so they didn't even give us a cross-section. It would have been better if they did so that we can compare it to the cross-section here. Instead, what we're looking at here is a picture at the surface, like if we're looking straight down on this diagram that's a drawing of that tissue. But if we were to cut through this tissue right here and then look at the cut surface of it, that's what it would look like right here. Okay. That cut surface there, there's your basal membrane and the cells overall are flat or squamous shaped. This would be a simple epithelium and we would name it simple squamous. And then don't forget the word epithelium. Epithelium would be plural by the way, right? So where are some typical locations for this? Well, the very thin cells are real good at allowing things to diffuse into the deeper tissues where blood vessels are and allowing things to diffuse out. So the air sacs in the lung, where we got to get oxygen in and out. Capillaries, which are the tiniest blood vessels, are going to have this simple squamous because the blood has to deliver oxygen and pick up waste products from there. And so 
uh, real good function at diffusion. Uh, and the cell types, they're epithelial cells, right? So now for the kidney, the uh, cuboidal, here is uh, the kidney has microscopic tubules. So they're not even showing how where that comes from. But if we were to cut into the kidney, the, the the outer layers of the kidney are going to have these microscopic tubules that are formed from uh, cuboidal cells. And if you were to cut through one of those tubes, this is what it would look like in cross section right here and then in long section along here. And this would be the basal side. There'd be connective tissue out here. And on the inside of the tubule would be the apical or the free side. Okay. And you can see that these cells have a lot more cytoplasm in there. They have a large round centered nucleus. And that makes this uh, cuboidal, simple cuboidal. Now you have a lot more cytoplasm, so that means this, uh, these cells can do a lot more things, like not just diffusion, but also absorption. And absorption to absorb requires energy. So absorption, that means you're going to be pumping things in. Secretion. You have a lot more cytoplasm, so you can make things that you can let out. And so that's what these cells are doing. And so here's an actual picture that takes a long section through a kidney tubule. So this is a kidney tubule cut through right here. And this would be the lumen, which is the empty space inside that kidney microscopic tubule. So it's aligned with those cuboidal cells there. So um, the cells, this is very good at secretion. So that makes them good at being glands. Absorption, like in the case of the kidney, has to reabsorb things that are filtered out. Uh, your kidney filters out everything important and the waste products itself. So the kidney has to work to get the important things back in and let the waste uh, uh, out. So one location that you find that would be kidney tubules and other, other places where secretion occurs. Ovaries, for example, would be lined with uh, cuboidal. They do you know, ovaries secrete hormones, uh, female hormones. Right, so uh, again, the cell types uh, here, they're epithelial cells, but they're modified to do secretion uh, called glands. And then lining the inside of your intestine here, the intestine is kind of folded, but I'm going to outline here what the basement membrane, where the basement membrane is. And this is the apical side right here. The apical side it looks frizzy or fri uh, fuzzy because there's little microvilli that uh, increase surface area. So this is where food would be, food, uh, watery food that you've eaten and has been broken down is now traveling through the intestine. And the intestine is not going to just let anything in because down here is your connective tissue where there's blood vessels. There's no blood vessels up here. But these cells need to actively provide, uh, uh, bring things in that are important, nutrients, and then send them uh, to the tissue over here. Uh, so this would be simple columnar. And notice the cells are longer and the nucleus looks oval in shape, and the nucleus is off-center towards the basal side. That's how you're going to recognize columnar epithelium. And then notice, I mentioned earlier and underlined, the cell that kind of shaped like a wine goblet. That's why they get their names, wine goblet, or they're called goblet cells, and they produce a protein called mucin. And when that mucin is secreted here at the surface, it mixes with the water and turns into mucus, which helps protect the lining of of the intestine. Okay, so there are, uh, that was simple epithelium. All of those were one layer thick. Okay. Then we have uh, stratified, which is two or more, two to several or many, like up to a 30 or more, especially if it's your skin, uh, cell layers thick. So anytime you have stratified, that's going to be good against abrasion. When things are rubbing, uh, you're going to rub off the top layers and then the deeper layers uh, build that back up. So let's take the case of something like your skin or the lining of your mouth. That's twice in a row. So I've been trying to draw here today that I mess up. So let's say this is the basement membrane. And this is deep here. So this would be the basal side. And you're going to have a layer of cells here that look cuboidal. Okay. And so they're cuboidal, and sometimes you can, sometimes you can't see a nucleus in uh, real tissue preparations. These cells are going to divide here. The blood supply is down here in the connective tissue, and you get all the nutrients and oxygen you need to run a metabolism that gives you good enough uh, energy and nutrients to divide. So these cells divide. One stays behind on the basal layer, and the other one moves up. So now you have two layers. It's already stratified at this point. Now, as these cells move to the surface, they may change shape. 
and they'll start to flatten. And they're going to start to look squamous, more flat. So how do we know what we're going to name it? It is stratified. That's going to be part of the name. So we know it's a stratified, but we need to give it a shape. It's stratified something epithelium. Well, the key here is to be able to understand the second statement right here. How are they named? They're going to be named according to their apical cells. This is the apical side here. And what shape is that apical shape? It's squamous. So this would be a stratified squamous epithelium. Your skin is a stratified squamous epithelium. The linings of the inside of your mouth, uh, your esophagus where food goes down, where uh, the, the surface cells get rubbed off and they're replaced constantly by the deeper cells dividing and pushing the older cells upwards. Okay. Now there's going to be two kinds of stratified squamous uh, epithelium. There are uh, stratified cuboidal epithelium, stratified columnar epithelium, but they're less abundant in the body, and we're not going to cover those here. Just be aware that they do exist. Uh, for uh, terrestrial vertebrates, those that live up on land outside of water, their outer skin, which we call the epidermis, is going to be keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium. That means it's going to have a lot of protein uh, that makes the skin drier and helps prevent water loss. So it helps prevent water loss and helps things that are dissolved in water from getting in your body. So totally protecting our body from that. That keratin recall is the same protein that makes up scales in lizard and snake reptiles. It's the same one that makes feathers and the same one that makes our hair. So those cells that are dividing to make your skin, uh, the outer layer of your skin, uh, make keratin as they're developing and then moving toward the top. Now, uh, when you have openings to the outside of your body, like your oral cavity and other openings, they're going to be lined with an epithelial tissue as well. However, it's not going to be keratinized. The inside of your cheeks is a stratified uh, squamous epithelium, but it's non-keratinized. In fact, it's going to be considered a mucosa, and it's going to be coated with uh, um, mucus and other lubricating uh, uh, proteins that help once mixed with the water. Uh, help lubricate. So like when you're chewing around, the food's moving around your mouth, it helps reduce the amount of uh, abrasion, but you still lose cells as uh, food is moving down through there. So you constantly have to replace them. So here's an image showing, they didn't give a very good image here of the stratified uh, squamous epithelium. In fact, this area right here is actually the basal side. This the area from here this way is the stratified squamous epithelium and the apical site is down here somewhere. They didn't even show the free surface. Where I'm going to sketch right now, this is the basement membrane. And the first row of cells right below the line I'm drawing are the basal cells that divide. As they divide, they push the older cells further and further outward. And as they move outward, they start to change shape. You can start, start seeing them become flatter right here towards the end. And they're flattening out. This would be like the tissue that lines the insides of your mouth uh, and your esophagus. Now over here, this drawing, the basal, the basement membrane is here, so this is the basal side. So the drawing is actually opposite of the micrograph here. This is the apical side here, and you can see the cells are flattened. And then lower here are the basal cells down here in the basal layer. They're all epithelial cells. They just, as they divide and move upwards, they go through a change. They go through changes through a development. Okay, so. The main cells for this type of stratified squamous uh, epithelium is their epithelial cells. And this is about protection from uh, rubbing and abrasion uh, overall. Again, all you got to do is add more keratin and you have your skin. Uh, and it's still a stratified squamous. Here's a special kind of epithelium. They have it as uh, with in the same box with stratified, but it's a pseudo. Like pseudopodia, which means false feet with amoeba. Pseudo here means false, but falsely stratified. This is a special tissue in a good location. Remember where it's found is in the lungs, the respiratory tract, lining your trachea, okay, so the respiratory system. It's called pseudo stratified because it looks like it's stratified because the nuclei that are in the tissues there, the nuclei are at various levels. However, every cell is attached to the basement membrane. That was different than the stratified. Remember the basal layer divides and the cells start moving away? 
from the basement membrane here, every one of those cells does not reach the surface, but they all touch the basement membrane. So some don't make it to the top, like this little triangular shape one here. And so overall, like in this real image here, it, it makes a false impression like there is a stratification there, but there's not. So this lines your respiratory tract, and you can see those goblet cells that secrete mucus that were mentioned earlier for the columnar epithelium. And they say to secrete uh, mucus to the to the inside surface of your of the inside of your trachea. It's hollow, right? So there's an internal surface in there. So it secretes mucus, and the mucus comes up here and rides on top of uh, uh, a slightly salty water that's found here with the cilia. So there's little cilia there that beat, just like the cilia we discussed being on the gills of clams. And this tissue does the same thing that a clam does to get its food, except this is not for us to get food. The clam gets its food by capturing little particles with sticky mucus, and then uh, the cilia move the food particles to the mouth. Here, we're trying to capture dust particles, bacteria, and other things that might go into deeper into our lungs. We're trying to capture them there with the mucus, and then the cilia moves them away from the lungs up to your throat in your pharynx where the foodway and the airway pass. And then what do we do? We just swallow it. It gets down into your acid and basically destroys just about almost anything if it's a bad bacteria or whatever. Not always, but that's usually the case. Or you spit it out, but we don't go around spitting all the time. Uh, so this will be called pseudo-stratified columnar epithelium and uh, respiratory tract, the, the trachea. And then glands. Glands are produced from uh, epithelial tissue. They do develop from epithelia. At, you know, the epithelia is at the surface during development, early development. Think about being in uh, an embryo uh, or as these glands are, are developing uh, as you're going through your childhood. The surface tissue, the epithelium, begins to divide, the cells divide and start moving inward. So that's what the word invagination means, invaginated epithelium. And there's two kinds of glands that form, exocrine and endocrine. The endocrine gland is famous for the endocrine system, which has to do with hormones, right? But so let's take a picture of early development. This would be the surface. So that makes this your, your epithelium. So the epithelium, the cells begin to divide and start to move inward to the deeper tissue, okay? You start seeing it move to the deeper tissue. Cells are dividing, moving deeper and deeper. Now, if those cells that are going in deeper, they're going to start to differentiate to produce things that we're going to secrete. If a little tube forms, a duct, and that duct remains connected to the surface, this would be the surface, and the surface could be the inside of your digestive system. The surface just means to the, to the, to the surface of the outside organ or to the inside cavity of the organ because the wall of the organ has other tissues in it. So just to the surface, that's what that means. So not into the deep tissues of the organ, but to the surface, whether it's the inside uh, cavity of the organ or the outside surface. So if a duct remains, so this would be a, this would be a duct right here. And these would be the secretory epithelial cells all right here. If we secrete to the surface, that would be an exocrine gland. We're going to be connected by a duct. Okay, And this is true of sweat glands. Sebaceous glands are a fancy way of saying oil glands. And your salivary glands that produce saliva that secretes into the oral cavity of your mouth. Now, if you're ductless, how does a ductless form? It... it the ductless gland forms the same way. It's going to form the same way when we get to this step here, except that during the development, the duct cells degenerate. So that little dashed line represents where those cells used to be. They go away. They get So the connection to the surface is gone. And instead, what you're going to get are these little blood vessels called capillaries. And these cells are going to be producing products that are secreted into the tissue fluids that then get picked up by the blood supply and circulate all around, which is what our hormones do. They circulate around until they hit the right target tissues that have the receptors for those hormones. Uh, and that changes the activity of the cells. So this would be your endocrine gland and how it forms. It forms the same way as an exocrine, except we break the connection. This would be an exocrine gland. The connection, exocrine, connection to the top through a duct. So here's examples here 
uh, they just took from the from the thigh there. This would be where the skin is. This would be down into the skin here. Here's the bottom of the gland. All of the, the cells that make it up are epithelial cells and they form the way we mentioned over here, just like this, okay? So your sweat gland is an uh, exocrine gland. Now your pancreas actually has exocrine function. It has tubes or ducts that lead to your intestine and that makes it exocrine. It produces digestive or, uh, uh, juices for digestion. But in the walls of the pancreas are going to be these little islands of cells. They're called pancreatic islets or islets of Langerhans. And they have two different types of cells, beta cells and alpha cells. The beta cells secrete something you probably heard before, insulin. And the insulin goes into your blood, not into the digestive tract. So that's, that makes it endocrine. So these cells are endocrine from the pancreas, and insulin helps you control your blood sugar. The alpha cells secrete another hormone that does the opposite of insulin. It's called glucagon. So these are two hormones that help you regulate your blood sugar. So in this section, we're looking at a second of the primary tissues. In this case, we're going to be looking at connective tissues. And the learning outcomes for this one are to describe the structure and function of connective tissues, to differentiate among the forms of connective tissues, and to list the cells that make connective tissue. So what is a connective tissue? First of all, it is derived from uh, the germ layer called mesoderm, which is the embryonic germ layer. There's two major classes of connective tissue. There is the connective tissue proper, and then there are the special connective tissues. The proper can be broken into two main categories, the loose and the dense, and for the loose, there are three subtypes, and for the dense, there's three subtypes, but we're just going to generalize about them. For the special connective tissues, there's cartilage, which you might have heard of, and bone, and blood. And for cartilage, there's three kinds as well, and we'll see a couple of those uh, in this section. Now, what's true about all these is that unlike um, epithelial, remember epithelial was avascular. That means no blood vessels in there, okay? For connective tissue... They, there is a range of vascularity. They're either you have connective tissues like cartilage, which are avascular, or you have tissues like bone, uh, which have a lot of vascular tissue, a lot of blood vessel in there. So there's a range of that from there. Now, another thing is that the cells have a lot of extracellular space between them, unlike in epithelial, the cells were tightly bound together. So here, that extracellular space is not empty. It's going to be filled with an extracellular matrix. Sometimes we say ECM for extracellular matrix. Now, the cells of the tissue are the ones, for the most part, that make this extracellular matrix. And it's going to be made of two main things, protein fibers and a ground substance, which is going to be made of water and other things that are dissolved within it. Now, what makes these tissues different and makes them have different qualities or properties to them, there's a difference between cartilage and bone, for example, is what makes up that ground substance, what's in there, uh, and how much of the protein fibers there are. Okay, so uh, varying these things will give you a variation in what these connective tissue properties are. So, looking at the connective tissue proper, uh, for the first one, we're going to be examining a loose connective tissue first. There's a dense one as well. So we're going to look at these here. Now, when it comes to connective tissue proper, which includes both the loose uh, proper connective tissue and the dense proper connective tissue, uh, they both are going to have fibroblasts. Remember, one of the objectives is to know the cell type. So the cell type is generally called a fibroblast, which makes the fibers. So in this diagram here, we can see a fibroblast there. This fibroblast is responsible for producing the protein fibers and the matrix that's there. So there's one of those fibroblasts. Here's another one right here. Okay. So they produce that extracellular matrix, which is made of proteins in the ground substance. Now, when there is a loose connective tissue, what makes it loose is that there's a loose connection of these protein fibers. So when we look at this ideal diagram, it's actually based on a loose connective tissue called areolar connective tissue. Okay. 
This loose connective tissue would be our model for all of the other proper connective tissues. All we got to do is vary how much protein fibers in there and cell types and so on. But this, uh, what makes it loose is that there's not a high density of protein fibers in there. You can see it looks like there's a bunch of empty space. It's not empty space because it's going to be filled with a ground substance. But you're going to have other cell types in there like macrophages, which are large white cells that go around patrolling and eating um, things that get in there. It could be like if you have a bacteria invading. You're going to have lymphocytes, which are also another kind of white blood cell and neutrophils. Uh, and uh, other cell types like fat cells that are found within there that store fat. They're called adipocytes. Okay, so uh, that's key. And then for the protein fibers, there's going to be three general kinds found in there. Collagen, which has a lot of great tensile strength, provides a lot of support in there. Elastin, which is uh, a lot, uh, gives the ability to stretch and recoil, uh, recoil, come back to its original shape. And another kind of protein fiber made of a protein called reticulin. Uh, so there are reticular fibers. So you can see them identified here. The thickest fibers are the collagen uh, right there. Uh, here's your elastic fibers. And then the uh, reticular tend to be more branched and much thinner, uh, which pr provides for some given these uh, uh, within the organs, these connective tissues are, are, are placed. So that's a loose connective tissue. Uh, now, within a loose connective tissue like that, if you have a lot of adipocytes, then we call it an adipose tissue. Uh, so adipose cells are also called adipocytes or fat cells. If they're in there, they're going to store, we would call it fat. And, and adipose stores energy and provides insulation for your body, helps you keep you from losing too much heat. Um, and can I even cushion organs like your kidney. And here you can see these cells are, they have a real large vacuole and there's so much uh, uh, fat uh, stored within each one, a fat droplet. This is microscopic, right? So that's 200 micrometers. But they can store so much fat within one cell that it pushes the cytoplasm off to the side. So you can see the nuclei, they're there and the cytoplasm really pushed to the side and these cells job is to store uh, fat and energy source. Okay. So adipose is actually considered a kind of loose connective tissue. And then we go to the dense connective tissue, and you can really see the difference now. If you look at the two images that I found here, you can see all of that pink, that those pink lines that are going across, they're parallel. That's collagen. There's a lot of collagen in there. It doesn't look as spacious as the uh, areolar loose connective tissue, so that's what makes it dense connective tissue. Uh, and now when the fibers run parallel, so they run parallel, they're wavy, that gives some give to it, but, uh, and you can see the fibroblasts, those are those uh, stained cells in this, this is a slide specimen of the of this tissue here. Uh, when the when the fibers run parallel, we're going to call that regular, that's a key feature there. So that's going to be dense regular connective tissue. In this other one here, you can see the collagen fibers there. They're kind of stained orange, and you can see the fibroblasts, which produce them. But the collagen fibers are going to run in sheets that run in various directions. So that makes the, the dense collagen fibers in there not in a regular direction, but an irregular. So that's a distinction in how you tell the difference between dense regular and dense irregular connective tissue. Now, when the fibers run parallel like this, that makes a real good tensile strength along one direction here. So you find these in, in uh, structures called tendons and ligaments, which experience a lot of powerful forces along one direction, uh, like uh, when the muscle pulls on the bone, the tendon connects the muscle to the bone, and then ligaments hold bones to, uh, together. So the structure of the collagen in there, collagen fibers, makes sense. Now, whenever your uh, organ experiences a lot of stretching uh, forces in many directions, like your skin or uh, any, uh, any given organ that it can experience uh, forces in, in several directions there, uh, you're going to find this uh, uh, type of tissue. It, it forms the capsules of many organs. There's a capsule that surrounds your bone. There's capsules that surround your muscles, uh, your, your glands, uh, the endocrine glands. These capsules surrounded and they're very tough. They're made of this dense irregular connective tissue. Uh, and that provides, and your skin too, not the outer one, that the epidermis is, is made of epithelial tissue, but the lower layer, the dermis, uh, is made of this connective tissue is, and, uh, 
your skin can get stretched in all kinds of directions, and that's uh, the reason for these sheets of collagen fibers. Uh, so when it says covers kidneys, muscle, nerves, and bones, let's say that generally that's capsules of organs. That's another way of saying that. Okay. Uh, and so that allows for providing uh, forces in multiple directions, uh, stretching, uh, providing tensile strength to that organ. So here's a summary from your textbook showing the difference just between loose and, and dense proper connective tissues. Uh, and this one is based on the model I showed you earlier. This is actually areolar connective tissue. Uh, by the way, the space in there provides space for blood vessels. So you can see a blood vessel drawn in there. You can't see really make one out in this image here, but if we go back over here, here's a capillary right there. So the loose connective tissue would be vascular. It would have uh, uh, blood vessels there. Uh, and so this would be areolar connective tissue, and it is a kind of loose connective tissue. If you just throw a bunch of adipocytes in there, then it would be adipose tissue. So where do you find it? It says beneath the skin. I mentioned earlier that under epithelial tissue, you're always going to have a loose connective tissue. It's going to be a binding kind of tissue. And then you might have dents below that, like your skin. The, ep uh, the epithelium on the top, the stratified squamous epithelium, will be on top of areolar, and then areolar then will be on top of uh, a dense connective tissue. Okay, so uh, basically, this can help provide support for uh, your organ insulation, food storage, like if it's adipose tissue, and it helps to nourish the epithelium. So uh, sometimes we refer to this uh, as universal packing tissue. Uh, and it's, you're always going to find loose connective tissue right underneath an epithelium. Uh, and other kind, the main th cell type is a fibroblast. Remember, you need to know your cell type. Fibroblast produces that. But then in loose connective tissue, there's space for other cells like the, the big eaters, macrophages, these large white cells, other white cells, and fat cells. For the dense connective tissue, there's not as much space because of all of that dense fibers. There's not as much blood vessels in there either. So... When it, said, it says the sheath around the muscle, that's the capsule, the capsule around the kidney, liver, uh, so on. That's where you find this, um, this dense connective tissue. This is a dermis. It's going to be a dense irregular. They, here, this image is showing dense regular. They're not making a distinction here. I'm just letting you know because you'll see it in the lab as well. Uh, so what this provides is a strong support or connection for there. And the cell types here, there's not a lot of space for anything else, fibroblasts. Another kind of connective tissue is called cartilage. And uh, cartilage, there's three kinds. And I, I went in and got a picture just to demonstrate that there's three. But there's a, one feature that allows you to tell uh, where that it's cartilage. First of all, chondro, like we saw with chondrichthys for the cartilaginous fish, chondro, that same root, chondrichthys, chondro, and chondrocyte. Chondro means cartilage. Site means cell. So this is a, a cartilage-making cell. Okay, so the chondrocytes, which you can see that term right there on the last uh, statement on this slide, the chondrocytes produce the matrix. And this matrix is going to be made of collagen fibers, which is the protein fibers. And then you're going to have a ground substance that's made of a special kind of glycoprotein called chondroitin. Okay. That and a lot of water. And this is going to give cartilage um, a resistance to compressions uh, overall. And then when you put the capsule around the cartilage, the cartilage itself will have a capsule. Uh, it's called uh, the, uh, the perichondrium. And, but it, it's just a capsule, right? So when you do that allows a lot of resistance for compression, and the, and the capsule keeps everything from just exploding outward. So where do you find these cartilages? You'll find them in places where we need support. And uh, shock absorption, for example, cushioning. So you'll find them on the ends of bones. And uh, the main one that you do find like that at the end of bones is called hyaline cartilage. Now, the cartilage cells are going to build the matrix around themselves. And when they do, they trap themselves in the matrix. And there's not, and there's no vascular tissue in here. So uh, oxygen and stuff has to diffuse uh, from blood vessels in the cat outside where the capsule is. Oxygen has to diffuse through the matrix to get to those chondrocytes that are in there. So those chondrocytes, this is a real picture representing the, the this is a diagram representing a real picture there. Those chondrocytes, like the one you see right there, are trapped within 
a cavity that they leave behind for themselves and they stay in there and they help maintain the cartilage. Those cavities are called a lacuna singular. Put an E at the end and that's plural. So they're in lacuna. Okay. Now, um, the surfaces you find them in varies. The most common kind is hyaline cartilage. Elastic cartilage is only found in two places, not really considered part of the skeleton itself. Uh, they found the, the ears and then the epiglottis, which protects you from choking uh, your windpipe. And then you have fibrocartage in places like the discs between your uh, back. And the difference here is this is a cartilage that requires a, a lot of uh, uh, force, uh, compression force, uh, like the discs in your back. So that is, it's, it's going to have a lot of collagen in there. So it almost looks like dense, regular connective tissue. But what's the difference? You can see the cavity where the chondrocyte is in. You cannot see that in dense, regular connective tissue here. The fibroblasts are kind of just sitting on top of the collagen fibers that they produced. Here, you can tell this is cartilage because if you look at the real picture here, you can see that chondrocyte and you can see the lacuna in there and boom, you know it's cartilage just like that. Okay. Um, uh, but overall, that's cartilage and it's a special kind of tissue, right? So, so we were looking at the proper connective tissues, there was the, the loose connective tissues, and then the dense connective tissues were proper, and then the special kind. Cartilage is one of them. The next two are going to be bone and blood. And for bone, uh, bone organizes itself in very regular structures like this. And the bone matrix, uh, it starts out with protein and um, protein fibers and some other substances that are in the ground substance that at first is soft, but then uh, that uh, proteins in there start attracting calcium minerals from your tissue fluids, and they start to deposit in there, and it makes the matrix hardened. The other problem is, is that hardened matrix with the calcium prevents oxygen from diffusing through the matrix, so the bone needs its own blood supply. So in these cavities that you see here, these circles, those cavities run the length of your bone there. There's blood vessels in the living bone in there. And then the blood vessels bring blood and nutrients. And then the uh, the bone cells are within those cavities, which are also called lacuna. Okay, So they also have lacuni. The lacuni are the cavities they live in. And then these little lines that you see here, those little lines that are going uh, back and forth from one lacuna to the other, those represent little canals where the osteocytes touch each other and pass uh, information to each other and oxygen and nutrients and waste products back and forth to the blood supply. So that's taken care of right here. Those little lines are called canaliculi. Those little, those little lines between the, 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 the lacuna where the bone cells are. By the way, osteo means bone. And so osteocyte means bone cell. Okay, so the cells of bone, a special kind of connective tissue called osteocytes. Now, what are the function of bone? Support, because it makes your bones. Bones are an organ. This is just the main tissue of the bone organ. Um, uh, support, protection of your vital organs, like your skull, right, your ribs. Uh, levers for muscles to act on so you can move. Uh, and uh, storage for minerals. Your other systems, like your nervous system, your muscles, they need calcium to function correctly. So if your blood calcium gets too low, you go to the bone and take some from it. So it's the storage of minerals. The next special tissue is actually has a liquid matrix. It does have protein fibers, but they're dissolved uh, at the moment uh, when blood is normal. When you cut yourself, those fibers, uh, the proteins go through several reactions and then ultimately form fibers that are not soluble in the in the water anymore, uh, the water part of the plasma, uh, and that helps to form a blood clot, right? So we don't want that happening just at any, any moment. Now, I found a picture on purpose because this picture is from an earlier slide that we saw dealing with a protist parasite called trypanosoma. This is a blood sample taken, and you can see the trypanosoma parasites in there, okay? But that's blood. It's a sample of blood. And you can see the main kind of blood cells. They look like they're little donut and they're pink in color. They're called red blood cells. And erythros means red, this first part here. Erythros means red. Leuco means white. Okay. So those would be your white blood cells. Now, there's only one white blood cell. They're going to be larger than the red blood cells. The red blood cells don't have a nucleus. So you won't see a nucleus in there. It'll look... Uh, like there's a hole in there, but it's there's not a hole. It's just it's so thin where the nucleus used to be. It almost looks like there's a hole there. 
the blood cells are kind of a disc shaped. Uh, but here's one of the white types of white blood cells. It has a real large irregular shaped nucleus in there. That would be an example of a leukocyte. Okay, so the leukocytes, they're going to be larger than red blood cells, and you're going to see an obvious nucleus in there. And if you ever take an anatomy class, you'll have to learn to identify and know the functions of the different white blood cells. There's also these platelets, which are these little specks right here, which are actually little pieces of cells that are produced where the rest of your blood is produced in the bone marrow. And these platelets form a uh, function in blood clotting. They help uh, as part of the blood clotting process. And they are technically called thrombocytes. Okay? So this is a special kind of uh, uh, connective tissue uh, in which the extracellular matrix is fluid. Now, when it comes uh, time to what is the function of this, it's about transport. Blood transports oxygen. Uh, and the waste carbon dioxide. It transports nutrients and metabolic waste. It transports hormones. So blood is about communicating these things to where they need to go. Uh, the blood cell, the, the blood also provides a uh, location for uh, immune system to work in. So the immune system works partly in the cardiovascular system within uh, through your blood. Uh, and there's another system that it works, the lymphatic system. So here's your summary. They're only showing one kind of cartilage here. It's the chondro, the hyaline cartilage. You just know it as cartilage. Uh, there's your, your chondrocyte is there within the lacuna and your ground substance. And typical location is going to be at joints, right? Uh, your trachea is made of hyaline cartilage, part of your respiratory tract. Uh, and here the, um, the cartilage function to help provide support, like your nose, the soft part of your nose, your ear. Uh, and provide shock absorption, um, right, for uh, compression stresses. And the cell type is a chondrocyte. For the bone, uh, the bone where we find it is in the skeleton. And it, uh, our men went through all of those uh, features, right, protection, support uh, for your body mass, uh, levers for muscles to work on, um, and storage for minerals of calcium. Uh, so there's lots of functions for that. And the cell is the osteocyte. And then for blood, is found in the cardiovascular system. The circulatory system is more broad than just cardiovascular. And again, it functions in transport. So it goes over some of the things that are transported there. And some of the cell types include erythrocytes, red blood cells, and leukocytes, the white cells, and then there's the platelets. They didn't give a real picture of blood, so they gave a, an enhanced scanning electron micrograph. Uh, but the picture I provided there is more what it, blood would look like under a light microscope, but this one is one with parasites that you've seen before, uh, trypanosoma. So in uh, this section, we're going to look at muscle tissue, which is an excitable tissue because it does respond to stimuli from the nervous system that makes it uh, an excitable tissue. Uh, and the response for the muscle tissue is to contract or shorten. And so your objectives for learning outcomes or objectives for this one are to identify the unique features of muscle cells. And the second one is to differentiate among the three kinds of muscle cells. How are they different structurally and the way they function? So muscles are described as the motors for the vertebrate body. Muscles, this, that's true of invertebrates as well. There's muscle tissue there. Uh, but what is meant by motors is that the muscles do the moving. They move your body around, they allow you to move your face around so that you can make facial expressions, and they move food through your, uh, through your digestive tract and so on. So they're the movers. There's going to be three kinds of, of muscle tissue. There's going to be smooth muscle, skeletal, and cardiac, and their image here on the right. Here's skeletal uh, for a muscle there in the arm. Cardiac is in the heart, and then smooth is found in your viscera, in your internal organs, your hollow organs. Now... The skeletal and the cardiac are known as striated because they do have this striped pattern to them. You can see here uh, in this image of skeletal muscle under magnification, the tissue, you can see that banded pattern that's there. And the same is true for cardiac muscle. You can see this banding pattern. Then a big distinction here is that there's branching in the muscle cells, and then there's a big dark stripe every now and then. Uh, and that has a uh, functional purpose. For the smooth muscle, if you look real close at it, you're not going to see that stripe pattern. And that pattern has to do with the arrangement of the protein fibers involved in contraction. They're very highly organized in such a way that it creates these light and dark uh, patterns within there, within the striated muscle, which is uh, 
um, skeletal and cardiac. Smooth muscle doesn't have that much, that uh, highly organized arrangement, so it looks more uh, smooth in general. Now, from all of these muscles, the only one that you can control consciously and uh, tell them what to do is skeletal. So we're going to refer to that one as voluntary. Whereas uh, these two right here, are involuntary. You, they contract without your thinking about it. That's good because that would be horrible if you had to think every time your heartbeat. Uh, you have to remind yourself, beat heartbeat, heartbeat. You know, uh, same thing as water. As uh, say that water burger you ate is being pushed through your your digestive system. You don't think about it; it just happens all on its own. So that's going to be involuntary. So smooth muscle, where is it going to be found? It's going to be found in your visceral organs, within your uh, hollow organs, like a urinary bladder, stomach, intestine, vessels, blood vessels. So for constricting arteries to reduce blood flow, for example. Uh, this tissue is characterized, the, the cells are long. They're going to be uh, long, but they're going to be uh, spindle or fusiform shape. They're going to be tapering at the very ends. Uh, and they're going to have one central elongated nucleus and then uh, another one and so on. Uh, so that's key here. Uh, you don't want to confuse it with stratified uh, squamous epithelium. almost looks like that, but when you look at a preparation from a, an organ that you took the smooth muscle from, you're going to see some other tissues on either side. And remember, epithelial tissue is supposed to be at the surface, so there's no way this could be an epithelial tissue if there's other tissues bounding each side of it, right? So it's involuntary, okay? Uh, and then for your skeletal muscle, it is striated, and uh, we usually get these, these muscles are usually going to be attached to your skeleton by tendons. So tendons we talked about earlier, they're going to be made of dense, regular connective tissue. And the muscle cells themselves are pretty long. They can be up to 30 centimeters long. Uh, which is, a, that's, see, you're talking about almost a foot uh, in length uh, there. So uh, they're pretty long, but they're very, very microscopically thin. And so what they do is they took a picture of a small section of what would be a much longer a muscle cell that's been sectioned to a real thin section. You can see that banding pattern. And what it is is one long muscle cell. Sometimes they call them muscle fibers because they're very long. It's not a protein fiber, but it's just a long cell. They call it a muscle fiber. Is, is what they call them. Um, and the way they form during embryonic development, the uh, myoblasts, which are the immature muscle cells, fuse together. Each one of them has its own nucleus. And when they all fuse together to make one longer cell, all of the nuclei are there. But the nuclei get pushed off to the sides. You can see one nucleus there, one there. This is a diagram of one of the muscle cells. And you can see the the plasma membrane. They, there's a bunch of fancy names. This, I took this from an anatomy book. There's a lot more detailed anatomy. You have to learn the ultrastructure. But just to highlight what the point is making here is that you have a very highly organized set of protein fibers in there involved in contraction. And they're bundled in these cords, these like rope-like cords. So within that cord, you're going to have two main kinds of protein in there. Uh, and those cords are called myofibrils. And the two main proteins are called actin, which is not new because if you study the cytoskeleton, your biology one class is made of, uh, the microfilaments are made of actin. But a protein that's different here is called myosin. It's found in muscle. And those two fibers are very highly organized in a way that gives this light and dark patterns. And so if we zoom in to one of these myofibrils found inside one muscle cell and look at it here uh, and then zoom in further, just to look at some of the fibers in there, you're going to see the thick fibers are the myosin and the thin blue ones are the actin. This very high, high arrangement of these uh, fibers in there allows the thick ones to pull on the thin ones. They actually pull with the help of ATP and they cause that little section to shorten. And this is happening all along the entire uh, myofibril and in every one of those myofibrils, and that gets the entire muscle to shorten. Uh, so it's striated, it's voluntary, it's found in skeletal muscle. You should know those things. And the main function for this is for movements uh, for your body. Right? And then cardiac, uh, the muscle cells are not so long, they're shorter. They typically have one and maybe two nucleus, but they do have this high arrangement of, uh, of, of myosin and actin in there. 
uh, but the muscles are shorter and they connect. They don't fuse together during development to form one long cell, but they're connected to each other where these dark bands are, okay? And those dark bands have a name. They're called inter, and you can see it labeled there. They're labeling one right there, intercalated, another one right there. They're called intercalated discs. And the intercalated discs have very strong connections that bind one muscle, uh, cardiac muscle cell to the other. Okay, so they're bonded really strongly there. So that means they're gonna have desmosomes. I mentioned that in an earlier one. You had desmosomes in skin cell, uh, the, between the, not the skin, but the skin, yes, but in epithelial in general. The desmosomes like rivet one side of skeleton to another. And then you're also gonna have gap junctions that allow the electrical signal to go from one cell to the next. And that electrical signal is what gets the, the heart cells to stimulate it to contract. Remember our muscle cells are excitable. They respond to that signal to contract. So that makes them an excitable cell. So you can tell this uh, from skeletal muscle because the cells don't, the tissue looks like the cells are branched. Uh, you see basically one nucleus, and you're going to see these intercalated discs uh, at random points around there. And what they did was they went and they superimposed a drawing of what some of those cells might actually look like in an ideal way so you can better see uh, the pattern that we visualize when we see the real tissue there. The function for this one is only found in the heart, and the function there is to get the heart to contract, and the heart has chambers in there that push that blood around your cardiovascular system. Here's an image from your lab manual, and it shows all three uh, pictures. On the right uh, column is the ideal drawings. This one is smooth muscle. Uh, we already went over all of those characteristics for them. Uh, involuntary, found in your visceral organs, your, the, 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 your internal organs. Skeletal muscle striated. It's got multiple nuclei. It's, they're basically cylindrical, and they can be pretty long, uh, and they pull on bones. And then cardiac muscle, which is also striated, only found in one location, which is in the walls of your heart. It's branched, one nucleus usually uh, per cell, and then the cells are short and branched, uh, and they're connected at intercalated discs, um, which has both strong connections, uh, desmosomes, and gap junctions. The desmosomes are to hold the cells to keep them from tearing apart, and the connection of the gap junctions is for the electrical signal to be passed from one cell to the next right away so they can contract. The last uh, of the major tissues, primary tissues, nervous tissue, it's also referred to as a excitable tissue uh, because it responds to a stimulus and uh, its response is not going to be to contract like a muscle tissue, but instead to send an electrical signal to either another nerve cell and stimulate that one, or to an effector like a muscle and stimulate that. So uh, when it becomes excited, its response is to send an electrical signal, uh, a message. So to message uh, another part of the body. So this is uh, done by accomplished by nervous tissue which is part of your nervous system and uh, nervous system organs. Your first learning outcome is going to be to describe the basic structure of a neuron, and then to describe the function of neural glia. The neural glia are going to be the support cells for the tissue, and they're considered part of the tissue, even though they're separate uh, uh, cell types. So uh, the cells of a nervous tissue include the neurons, that's, a, that's what a nerve cell is called, and the supporters called neural glia. Sometimes they're called also called glial cells. And so here's an image uh, here, and uh, the larger cell body that you see that looks branched with a, a dark nucleus in the middle, those are neurons, and uh, they have these processes called axons and dendrites that signals go through. And then all those other spots represent the nuclei of these uh, other types of glial cells, so they're identified with these arrows here. It says glial cells uh, in real small print there. <laughs> Uh, and so those are the supporting cells. There's different kinds of glial cells that have different roles in their support of the neurons. Uh, but we're not going to labor over all the different kinds. Uh, just be aware that they help and assist uh, in the functioning of the neurons. So looking at the neurons in general, the neurons are going to be made of a cell body that contains the nucleus and the other organelles that do things like synthesize neurotransmitters that are released by the neuron for communication. 
they're going to have these extensions. Uh, typically, the shorter ones are called dendrites. Uh, they're extensions of the cell body. Uh, and then one, they're always going to have one single long extension called an axon. And sometimes they call an axon a nerve uh, cell fiber. And in this case, it's just the axon that is uh, the case here. Now, uh, the nerve uh, cell body sometimes is called the neurosoma, because soma means body, which uh, we've mentioned before. Uh, so let's say I just drew the neurosoma, and then this real long extension here is the axon that then ends in branching, terminal branches. The neurosoma is going to have these shorter branches called dendrites. And so information signal always comes in through the dendrites or the cell body, and then it leaves as an electrical signal down the axon. So this is the axon. These are the terminal branches. These are the dendrites. And dendros means branch, uh, actually, in translation. So those are dendrite, dendrites uh, overall. So, uh, And the, the signal is based on the special ability for this uh, neuron to generate a, a small voltage across the membrane and then change that voltage, which uh, ends up being the, the uh, electrical signal called an action potential. That's the electrical signal. When it gets to the end, those terminals there at the end are going to release the neurotransmitters, and they might be connected to some kind of an effector like a muscle cell, for example. Uh, and that uh, excites the muscle cell, tells it to, to contract. So for the neuroglia, uh, the support cells, those don't uh, conduct any electrical impulses. They, they provide support and insulation. Um, for uh, the neurons to function properly. Um, and one kind of neuroglial cell form, helps form an insulation sheath around the axon. Uh, and uh, the, the cells have a special name called Schwann cells that do this. These are individual cells, and they'll make this little fatty uh, sheath covering around the axon. And then uh, that insulates and ha allows the electrical signal to be sent much faster. Uh, so it accelerates the electrical signal. Uh, and between each cell that produces this sheath is a little gap. And those gaps are called nodes of Ranvier or just uh, myelin sheath gaps. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Here's your, your neurosoma, your nerve cell body. This is a dendrite. Uh, and then this real long extension is your axon. And over here, generally, what the neuron attaches to and stimulates is an effector. In this case, a muscle cell. It could be a gland. Uh, and then uh, here's where the neurotransmitter is released to stimulate the muscle cells. The muscle cells are just there waiting to get excited. Now, along the axon are these uh, myelin sheath cells. They're called Schwann cells. A Schwann cell is a specific kind of uh, neuroglial cell. Okay. Uh, they form the myelin sheath, which is the insulation that speeds up the signal. Okay. Now, in between each cell, that's where your node of Ranvier is or your myelin sheath gap, right? So uh, it's the myelin sheath. So this is the myelin sheath gap, also called node of Ranvier. Okay, from the prior slide. Uh, so when it comes to this tissue, it makes up the nervous system, and the nervous system has organs, which are made of more than just nervous tissue. There's connective tissue and so on to make the organs. And the nervous system is divided into two main branches, the central nervous system, where things are integrated and processed. As you receive information, the brain and the spinal cord which are, part of, are the parts of the central nervous system, figure out what to do with the information it receives from receptors that are sending information in. And they integrates and then determines a response that goes out to the different parts of the body. So on this diagram here, your CNS, your central nervous system, is the brain and the spinal cord. Anything outside of that, the nerves that leave, 
uh, and ganglia, which are nerve cell bodies, are the peripheral nervous system. And it includes receptors as well. So what is the function of the central nervous system? Receiving that information and integrating it. The integrating is going to process it and then um, send the output out to the effectors. Uh, and then the peripheral nervous system is, is this is the relay. Uh, it, 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 these are nerves that are going to bring in information into the central nervous system. And then once processed, the output goes out of uh, these nerves that are outside of the spinal cord in the brain. Uh, so overall, the nervous system is about communication uh, and coordination within the entire body. So this is an overview of the organ systems found in vertebrate animals. And your objectives are, one, to identify the different organ systems in vertebrates. And this includes some of the basic organs that are uh, part of the organ system. And then uh, to explain the functional organization of these systems. And overall, how are they organized in a way that they connect with each other, or integrate with each other, to help maintain overall balance or homeostasis for the survival of uh, the, uh, the animal, the organism. So uh, we can, we can uh, group some of these organ systems based on uh, some of the roles that they uh, perform with each other uh, and group. So the first one is a couple of organ systems that are involved in communicating and integrating the activities of the body. Uh, and so these organ systems are sensing the stimuli, uh, integrating that information, and then providing a response that coordinates activities of the overall body. And that includes the nervous system and the endocrine systems uh, overall. Uh, sensory is uh, uh, be part of both of those systems overall. The, the cells have ability to, to uh, sense stimuli. The, the nervous system specifically has receptors um, and um, the, the main thing about this, this group of uh, the organs and organ system is that they, uh, they sense, they respond uh, to stimulate to coordinate body activities. And then we have uh, support and movement. And that includes the mus muscle system and the skeletal system. Sometimes they are combined to musculoskeletal system. The muscle does the moving and the bones provide levers for those muscles to pull on. Now, each system has other functions as well, but as a major functioning, that's the integration of those two and how they work together. And then we have regulation and maintenance. There's going to be four organ systems here uh, that regulate and maintain the body's overall chemistry. You're going to need energy, and, uh, energy nutrients and other nutrients, so there's a digestive system. The circulatory system is going to circulate uh, nutrients and oxygen to your tissues and remove wastes. Respiratory system helps exchange carbon dioxide and bring in oxygen. So we got to get rid of that oxygen waste. And then the urinary system helps you rid your body of metabolic wastes and also maintains your electrolyte balance uh, overall. And then we have defense, the immune uh, overall. So uh, the integumentary system is the boundary. Uh, and one of the things it does is it prevents things from invading our bodies that could make us sick. It has other functions as well. Uh, it functions in preventing drying up uh, uh, our body. It's waterproof. Um, and, and several other functions that the integumentary system does. And then there's your immune system, and it's immune systems. Uh, the immune system is sort of integrated within the other systems, uh, the circulatory system overall, the um, the uh, uh, cardiovascular and the lymphatic systems are part of that circulatory system uh, overall. And, and then even involves uh, the, the blood cell making abilities of your bone marrow. And so that's in the skeletal system. So there's some sort of, some sorts of integration there. But overall, there's, there's interconnectedness really for all these systems. And then finally, we have reproduction and development. And, and this is uh, probably a system that is least relevant to immediate maintenance of, of it, not that it's not important, but at least for the immediate needs of the organism to maintain uh, uh, survival on a day-to-day -day basis uh, overall. There are some hormones produced by the reproductive system that are overall important for 
uh, overall maintenance, but the main thing for the reproductive system is for continuity of the species to so the species continues into the future. Uh, and the males and females play different roles. The males provide um, the uh, uh, the sperm cells that would fertilize the egg. The female's reproductive system not only has to produce the the sex cells, the egg, but also has to provide uh, a place for the embryonic development, development of the fetus, as well as uh, nourishment in the case of uh, of uh, mammals, uh, nourishment of the of the infant overall. So here are your organ systems. Make sure you review these, look at them quickly, and know some of the basic roles and structures. The nervous system, remember it's about communication, coordination, and the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. Then you have your endocrine system. This is uh, another one for communicating. These are some of the major endocrine glands, and they include uh, the sex organs. The ovary and the testes produce uh, sex hormones. The pancreas, we know that's involved in uh, from earlier in blood sugar uh, balance overall. The master gland is the pituitary. Thyroid is involved in the setting your metabolism, uh, but that's the endocrine system. These are the two for communication. Then you have your skeletal system for support, protection of the organs, and for movement. Uh, and then there's some uh, other major bone structures in there. And then for your muscular system, the organ is a muscle. Uh, itself, and then they have identified specific muscles like your pectoralis major and your gastrocnemius, which is your calf muscle, uh, and those muscles pull on bones for movement. Then you have your digestive system. So now we get into the regulation of your body chemistry. Your digestive system has a lot of organs, and it starts with the mouth and ends uh, with the exit of the anus. It includes accessories like salivary glands. Your esophagus is the pipe leading to your stomach from the oral cavity. Your small intestine, where most absorption occurs, and then your large intestine, uh, which is going to deal with any waste that wasn't absorbed earlier. And then your circulatory system, they've actually identified here the cardiovascular system. It includes the heart and your arteries and your veins and smaller blood vessels there, and that's going to circulate uh, the things your tissues need, as well as get rid of waste products from those tissues to take them to your excretory organs. So technically speaking, this is the cardiovascular system, which is part of overall circulation. The other one is the lymphatic system. And then your respiratory system here, major organ there is the lungs uh, and then other accessories. Your trachea is the windpipe that takes the air down to your lungs so you can get oxygen in there. So this is about gas exchange. Then urinary system here, your kidneys receives blood uh, through the renal arteries and the blood is filtered there. Uh, and everything smaller than your cells and very large proteins gets filtered and that includes important things. But one thing you're trying to get rid of is urea, which is nitrogenous waste. Uh, and the formation, ultimately the formation is of urine and it gets stored in the urinary bladder and then you avoid the urinary bladder when it's become full. The kidneys also have to play a role in maintaining balance of your electrolytes. If you filter out all your electrolytes, you're going to lose them all with your urine, and that would be bad because your nervous system and your muscles and all that needs those electrolyte balance to work correctly. Then your integumentary system is a barrier from anything getting in and from you drying out, so this is about protection. Uh, and it's your first line of defense against uh, invading pathogens. Fingernails and hair are accessory, and your skin is the main uh, part of that uh, integumentary system. And then I mentioned lymphatic system. It was not mentioned in the text on the slides, but the lymphatic system is uh, the main place where the immune system works. Uh, you're going to have lymphatic vessels that return excess extra fluids back to the blood that are left in the tissues. Uh, but within the lymphatic system, uh, some white blood cells like to hang out in there uh, within structures called uh, lymph nodes. Uh, and I don't think they're identified on here, but lymph nodes are structures that are found along the lymphatic vessels and sort of act as filtering agents for that tissue fluid that's moving back uh, to, your, uh, to your veins to get back into your blood. Uh, the spleen is another, uh, and the thymus are also important in the immune system. And then you've got your male and female reproductive systems, uh, and the, ma the major sex organ for each one is the testes in the male and the ovary for the female. And then after that, all the other ones are accessories to help uh, make sure that uh, uh, for the males, the sperm is delivered to the reproductive tract of the female, and for the female, the other parts are there for... Um, 
nourishing embryonic development, supported embryonic development. So in this section, we're going to look at how the <coughs> organ systems function together to main an, maintain an overall uh, internal balance uh, for the organism. All the cells are going to require certain uh, to be maintained within a certain range for them to function properly. It's the cells that are functioning that in turn relate to the functioning of the tissues and the organs and these organs working together overall for maintaining this uh, internal balance in a vertebrate animal, which is multicellular. This process is referred to uh, maintaining internal balance as homeostasis. So uh, the learner should be able to explain homeostasis as an outcome, uh, illustrate how negative feedback can limit uh, a response, and illustrate how antagonistic effectors can maintain the system at a set point. So effectors are going to be uh, structures within the body that work to help bring back to normal if things get abnormal. Like if you go uh, and your body warms up too much, we got to bring that body temperature back down. Now, uh, the vertebrate animal, like all animals, is uh, ha has evolved to have lots of specialization when multicellular organs and organ systems developed. Uh, so there's a lot of specialized structures, and each of these structures all, all play a role in this process of homeostasis. They have to. They have to be uh, coordinated. Uh, and so <clears throat> overall, we have to maintain those internal body conditions. And so that coordination uh, with these specialized structures uh, and the roles that they play in this is, is quite important. Now, homeostasis is not going to keep you at, a, at the same point all the time. This process is dynamic. Conditions are always changing, both outside and inside your body. The important part is to maintain this dynamic constancy, constancy uh, internally, despite what's going on outside the body, right? And this is essential for uh, staying healthy and staying alive for any organism, not just a vertebrate animal. So the first uh, mechanism is the main one that uh, is going to help maintain homeostasis. It's called negative feedback. And negative feedback is a good thing. Uh, and basically, why is it called negative? Because when it comes to the physiological variables, and let's say this is uh, roughly the point where it needs to be at, like body temperature. Uh, if you move higher on body temperature, let's say this is going higher to the right, like on a number line, then your body needs to work to bring you back the other way. The same is true if you go lower than where your normal body temperature should be, your body has to work to bring you back in the opposite direction. And if we think of these directions in which the temperature is changing or any variable changes, in order to move it back the other way, you got to multiply it by a negative. So the negative brings it back. So if you think about how you move along a number line, going in the opposite direction is a negative change regardless. If you're going in a negative uh, direction here, lower temperature, a negative change would be positive now and going in the positive direction. So that's kind of the idea as to why it's called negative feedback. It's not that it's bad. This is a good thing. Okay, so... Um, in order for this to happen, you're going to need sensors, uh, receptors that are detecting these uh, physiological variables like body temperature, blood sugar. So that's a key there. Okay, You're going to need an integrating center to process from those sensors. They're monitoring. These, re these, uh, uh, these receptors are monitoring things like body temperature, blood sugar level, uh, pH, all that kind of stuff. And you're going to have these integrating centers. They're also called comparators, and uh, they might be the brain or the spinal cord that's the integrating center, or an endocrine gland that's capable of monitoring your blood chemistry or your tissue chemistry. Uh, and these integrating centers are going to have the ability to compare what the set point is. And really, it's not so much a set point, but more of a range. There's a range of acceptable values. Our body temperature, for example, is never exactly the same. Neither is your blood sugar, but there's a range in which things are good. If you go outside of it, things can get bad real quick, so we got to bring it back. Okay. So if we go too far out away from that uh, set point or that range, uh, then your body's going to set forth uh, a motion through the integrating center uh, that's going to tell... Uh, 
effectors, which would be uh, organs um, like muscles and glands, to do things that are going to uh, bring your your uh, temperature or your sugar, blood sugar, or whatever variable back, and that's negative feedback. So you're bringing it back to the to what the normal range would be. Okay, so um, now. Uh, here are some of these. The, these would be referred to as uh, physiological variables. Uh, and they include things like your body temperature, blood, blood sugar, electrolytes, like uh, potassium levels, uh, uh, and, and so on. So there's many of these that need to be maintained within normal limits. Uh, and so the integrating center... Uh, for example, an integrating center is often your brain or your spinal cord. Again, it could be glands, like for blood sugar, the pancreas monitors that. Now, the integrating center is going to send information once the integrating center determines how to bring the, vari the, the, uh, the variable back to normal limits or to keep it within normal limits. The integrating center is going to uh, interact with effectors, and effectors are going to either be muscles or glands. And those muscles or glands are going to work to change that value uh, to bring it back towards that set point. Okay. So, uh, so we have a basic diagram here. Uh, and we start with a stimulus. So the stimulus would be whatever variable, right? And that variable is going to be picked up by the sensor. Okay, So your variable, your stimulus is deviating from a set point. Maybe your blood sugar has gone too low. That's the stimulus. And you would have a sensor that monitors that. So it monitors those conditions and sends the information to your integrating center. It could be the brain or the spinal cord or another gland that's monitoring this. This integrating center has that set point or that set range. So it's comparing what am I receiving and where is it supposed to be. If the sensor detects that the stimulus is going too far one way or the other, too high or too low of a temperature or blood sugar or pH, uh, then the integrating center is going to send information to the effector. And the effector is going to set apart, uh, set in motion changes uh, that are going to help compensate for that. And that's going to provide a response overall that brings that value back to the set point. And that's what makes this negative feedback. Now, the receptors are sensing what's going on with that stimulus. So that stimulus is still monitoring. Did the change go far enough? If not, we gotta we gotta the integrating center is gonna do more of that until the information until we get back to that set point. Once the sensors detect that the stimulus is no longer there, that we're within normal limits, then the integrating center uh, cancels the effector uh, or doesn't it just it, it slows down uh, the work of that effector so that we no longer need to do that response again. Okay, so. Uh, the example here would be with endotherm mammals uh, and birds. We're endothermic. We maintain a constant body temperature. Remember, birds typically have a higher body temperature from our earlier chapter uh, on um, when we covered the vertebrate animals. Now, uh, we need to maintain within normal range despite what the external temperature is. It could be very cold outside or a real, a real hot day. Uh, and humans, for example, have a, a midpoint of around 37. Your body temperature will go higher and lower in the morning. It's probably lower when you first get up from bed, uh, which uh, this is in Celsius. Your body temperature in uh, degrees Fahrenheit is 98.6. That's the rough value. We got to keep it within a certain range. Too high, you can die. Too low, you can die. So you've got to make sure you keep within these normal limits. Now, the sensors or the receptors for uh, this temperature are located uh, as thermal receptors in your hypothalamus, which is in the brain. It's a structure within the brain. So the brain is detecting your core body temperature by sensing the temperature of the, that's going on within your body. There's also receptors on the outside of your body that can also are also providing some uh, of that information as well. But the main point point is, what is your core body temperature? Has it gotten too high? Okay, so uh, in the negative feedback, you're going to have um, um, the mechanisms that are going to basically 
work against each other. So negative feedback, if you go too cold, you're going to bring back to warm up your body. If you go too hot, you're going to bring back the other way. So uh, that would be controlled by uh, your the, the control center. The thermal control centers in your brain are going to control effectors that are antagonistic to each other. Okay, so uh, in other words, there's different effectors. There's different ones to warm you up, and different and uh, different ones, or at least uh, the way they behave, those effectors to bring you back. And so this is sort of a push and pull, an antagonistic effect, right? So, so increasing the activity of one effector, say, an effector that's going to bring your blood sugar back higher because it got too low is going to be also accompanied by the other process that would have done the opposite. So uh, you're trying to bring your blood sugar level back up, not down. So you're going to cancel the other effector uh, uh, portion so that we're, we're not working against each other. You want to cut off one so the other one can do its job uh, overall. So uh, we can examine how this works with body temperature, for example. Like and you, We know uh, already, we're familiar, it's an easy one to relate to because we know what happens when we get too hot. You start to sweat. Uh, and if you're light complected, you might notice even more, the more light complected, that your skin becomes flush and red. And that's because you're sending more blood to the surface, to your skin. Above the layer of fat we have on our skin, we have a layer of fat in our hypodermis, in the, the layer below the skin. And so you're trying to bring the blood outside of that because fat can be an insulator. So you're trying to bring it to the surface from your core so that it can bring that heat to the surface. And then you sweat, and then the sweat as it evaporates takes that heat away. That's one, if the, if the temperature is too high. That's one uh, effect, and the effectors have to do things, right? So uh, what is, what, what's promoted during this time when you uh, get too hot? Sweating. So you're sweating, your sweat glands are going to release sweat. And the blood vessels leading to your skin are going to dilate. Dilate means they're going to get bigger, and that's going to allow more blood flow to the skin. Now, what happens if your body temperature is too low? We're going to do the opposite. We're going to cancel the sweating. Okay, uh, It's not even going to be an issue. We're just not going to get the sweat glands to release sweat. So that's not going to be an issue when you're too low a temperature. Okay, When you're too low a temperature, you cancel the sweating. Uh, but now we're going to look at another effector. In this case, we're going to start shivering. So now we got a, a totally different effect. You're going to cause your skeletal muscles to start contracting because contraction of muscles creates heat. And then we're going to work on that dilation and we're going to cancel that dilation. And instead, we're going to constrict those blood vessels. So the blood vessels are going to decrease in diameter so that we're not taking blood, uh, a lot of blood to the skin. We're going to keep it in our core, we're going to keep it underneath that layer of fat in your skin. And that's going to promote the retention of heat and hopefully bring your core body temperature back up. And so the book likes to compare it to the thermostat in uh, uh, a building. Uh, and uh, there's the, the thermostat control to keep your, your room temperature normal. And it has its mechanical uh, engineered system uh, that humans make to cool or warm homes. And here the sensor is trying to detect whether or not the temperature is at a set point that you want. Let's say you want it to stay at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which would take a lot of energy here in South Texas because it's so hot outside uh, to try to cool. But let's say that uh, it's a cool day outside and the room temperature starts to drop too low. So the thermostat, which is the brain for this machine, detects that. What does it do? It's going to turn on the furnace, which is the heater, and turn off the AC. Okay? That's the effector. That's like the muscles shivering, right? Uh, and then the response there is hot air is going to be blown out into the building, into the room. That's going to warm the air, and the sensor is going to continue to sensor that and then go to the brain. And the brain of this thing, which is the thermostat, is going to be sensing, has it got to the right temperature? Once it gets to 70 degrees, what happens? We're going to cut off the effector, okay? And so we stay at 70. Now, if it drops again, then the thermostat kicks back on, turns back on the effector, and we continue. Same thing happens, uh, except we're talking about the brain sending information uh, to your muscles to start contracting and shivering, right? So we have our set point is 37 degrees Celsius here, and your body temperature has dropped too much. What's going to happen? We're going to send uh, we're going to send information from the brain, the control center, to the muscles to start contracting. 
the brain is also going to tell the blood vessels to constrict so that we don't send the blood to the skin. That's going to raise your body temperature. That's going to be picked up by the sensors in the hypothalamus, which then goes to the, uh, the, the control centers of the brain for this. And eventually, when your body temperature reaches the desired temperature, we cut off that effector. Same thing as over here. Now, we can imagine the opposite happening if uh, it gets too uh, hot in the building, right? Okay, if it gets too hot in the building, we don't want to turn on the furnace. So instead, we're going to go and we're going to turn off the furnace and we're going to turn on the AC. And that's the effector now is going to be uh, delivering cool air to the room. Uh, and that that output, the system, the system has an output. That output is going to be detected by the sensor. And the circuitry within that thermostat is going to say, hey, it's gotten cool enough here. We've gotten to 70 degrees and we cut it off unless the temperature changes drastically again. The same thing here, the receptors in the hypothalamus and then there's the thermal control centers that are interpreting this. If, it gets, if your body temperature gets too hot, what are we going to do? We're going to uh, send information to the effectors. Right, and uh, it's going to tell the sweat glands to start releasing sweat, and uh, the blood vessels in the skin to dilate to send the heat to the surface. That should have a cooling effect. Body temperature begins to drop. That's picked up by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus uh, gives that information to the integrating center, and the integrating center says, "You know what? Your body temperature is back to normal. Let's cut off the sweating and uh, uh, the dilation of the blood vessels because you don't want to get too cool." or cool down too much. So that's net negative feedback. And then finally, there is uh, uh, some processes, these are not common, called positive feedback. And in this case, the, within your body, your body is constantly sensing the environment. And a lot of times what's going on in your body is uh, your system uh, is sensing output that's going on uh, overall. So what is the output? Uh, the output could be external or internal, and it's sensing this, right? So your systems have this output that provides that feedback uh, in there. All systems do. Living systems, the mechanical system, like the thermostat that we were talking about. Okay, so but for positive feedback, that output is going to cause an increase in that variable, whatever it is. And uh, that's not good if you're trying to maintain an internal balance. However, it is appropriate in certain situations. And one is when you cut yourself. When you cut yourself, you're going to want to amplify the effect that creates a clot to keep yourself from bleeding to death. So when the stimulus is there and you, and you, and you start losing blood, that feedback is going to go and get the clotting uh, system to work even more. And then as it works even more, the output from that system is going to cause it uh, to amplify even further so we can get that uh, open wound closed up to keep you from bleeding to death. The other case is during childbirth. The uterus, as it contracts, uh, the brain tells it to contract even more and even more and even more. And this is to get uh, make sure that the fetus... Uh, can make it out of the uh, birth canal uh, so that that infant can be born um, in as efficient a uh, time as possible during this uh, very stressful process for for both the, the mom and uh, the fetus, then infant, once the, the, the infant comes out of the birth canal. Uh, so uh, in this case, positive feedback is not necessarily an important thing in maintaining overall homeostasis, but it is important uh, in some cases where we need to get something done uh, quickly so that uh, things are good for the overall health. So uh, the case for childbirth, uh, I won't go into the mechanism for blood clotting, but it is positive feedback here. Uh, once labor starts, the uterus starts to contract, and it's smooth muscle there, and it's controlled by a hormone called oxytocin released uh, by the pituitary gland in the brain. And uh, so when the uterus contracts, the muscle is pushing on the fetus. It's, it's called a fetus until it's born. It's pushing on the fetus. The fetus head starts pushing on the opening of the uterus called the cervix, and there's receptors there. Those receptors sense a stretch as the infants, uh, as the, the fetus is pushing on the cervix, it's causing it to stretch. 
those stretch receptors send information back to the brain. Okay, uh, so that's there. The integrating right there. The, uh, the stretch receptors are going to send. The sensors are going to send that uh, uh, stretch information um, to the integrating centers there. Uh, and there's, uh, it's going to compare it with what's going on. And what's going to happen here is that the brain is going to tell the pituitary gland to release the hormone oxytocin. So the, the hormone gets released, and it goes in intervals. And, the, and it starts to go faster and faster. The contractions come faster and faster and faster because it's the positive feedback. So what happens is when the oxytocin reaches the uterus, it causes the uterus to contract again. And what happens? That causes the, the head to push on the, the cervix harder, uh, and that's going to provide positive feedback, and that's going to cause a repeat, release more oxytocin. And you continue to do this, and the contractions come faster and faster and faster, and then eventually uh, birth occurs, and then the process stops. The stimulus is gone. Okay, so um, this is a good case of positive feedback there. So in this section, we're going to look at uh, how animals regulate their body temperature. And uh, first objective is to explain Q10 and its significance, and then describe the classification of organisms based on uh, their temperature regulation. And then the three, describe the mechanisms for temperature homeostasis. So temperature is going to be one of the most important aspects of the environment that organisms need to survive in. Uh, so uh, the organisms do have uh, a couple of options that they uh, evolve to uh, to behave within the environment, and one is to conform. Whatever the temperatures in the environment, that's going to be your temperature. In other cases, other organisms are going to regulate their body temperature, uh, and the way they go about regulating it uh, depends on the uh, several things so we're going to take a look at that so first of all we want to know what happens uh, to a metabolism when body temperature changes and, and uh, generally just like with a chemical reaction if temperature increases the rate of metabolism will increase okay so your rate increases when temperature increases so um, it turns out that it's observed that within uh, uh, ectotherms, and uh, this may even be the case with mammals within a certain range. Uh, mammals, you can't mess around with their temperature too much uh, for many of them, uh, because if you go too high, it's going to be uh, not good for them. But the idea of Q10 is actually it's a ratio. It's a calculation, and every 10 degrees increase in temperature doubles the reaction rate. So um, the reaction rate is basically your metabolism. Uh, so here, if R at T plus 10 is at whatever temperature is at, uh, it's just a different uh, reaction or metabolic rate at 10 degrees higher, when you compare it to or divide it by the temperature at the, uh, the metabolic rate at the original temperature. So it's observed that this uh, Q10 value is, is usually it's going to double every 10 degrees increase of temperature. Somewhere between two and three, actually. So let's say it doubled, approximately doubles the ratio here. So let's say your metabolic rate at temperature, uh, whatever the temperature is, let's say at 10 degrees Celsius, your metabolic rate is going to be five uh, milliliters, milliliters of oxygen. You can measure your metabolic rate by the amount of oxygen being used. Five milliliters of oxygen per gram. Uh, every every uh, every minute or every hour okay and so every hour and so well what would that so this down here is the metabolic rate at that temperature the temperature was at I said 10 degrees so what if we move this organism into an environment now that is 20 degrees it should double the answer should be approximately two well, what would that make that value up here? It would have to be double of what it was below here. So we can predict that the metabolic rate would roughly be 10 milliliters of oxygen per gram per hour uh, on there. So when you divide these two, the units cancel, and you get just the Q10 value of 2. Now, let's say the metabolic rate was 15 at temperature, whatever temperature, and then you 
take that temperature and you increase it by 10 degrees, the metabolic rate we would predict would go up to 30. It would double. That's what Q10 is. Okay. So uh, temperature overall for an animal is going to be determined by two major uh, influences. One is internal. Your internal metabolism gener can generate heat and external factors. So the overall metabolic rate and body temperature are actually interrelated. Uh, uh, the connection is there. So uh, the organism has to deal with both external and internal factors in order to regulate that, uh, that body heat or that temperature, both the environment and your metabolism. So we might refer to uh, your body temperature as body heat. There is a relationship between that temperature and heat. Technically, in physics, heat is the, actually the transfer of thermal energy. And thermal energy is just the energy of particle motion. The faster the particles move, the more thermal energy is. And heat is always transferred from more thermal energy to lower thermal energy. In other words, from higher temperature to lower temperature, not the other way around. So heat is actually the transfer of thermal energy to be more correct. Okay. And it's always from uh, high temperature or high thermal energy to low. Uh, since temperature is an indirect measure of thermal energy, so body heat more proper uh, temperature, but more properly body heat, right? So heat produced would be basically your metabolism, metabolic heat, and the heat transferred is going to be to the environment either to or from, and there's two aspects of it. There's the positive heat gained and the minus heat lost. Bodies are going to lose uh, heat to the environment. Even if it's warm outside, you're still going to lose heat in certain forms. So heat lost. Now this value over here on the right after the plus sign can be positive or negative. Depends on if more heat is gained or if more heat is lost. If more heat is lost, then it's negative. So metabolism is always going to be positive. Okay. And the overall answer to this could be uh, overall loss or overall gain. So remember, your body temperature depends on how much overall your body is gaining or losing. And how much your body is gaining or losing as a mass depends on your heat produced by your metabolism and the heat transfer to the environment, whether it's gained or lost overall. So again... Heat means transfer, so how much uh, you transfer overall is going to determine what your overall body temperature is. The, the relationship is there. Now, what ways can we transfer heat uh, to and from the environment? There's radiation, and bodies that have any temperature at all, even if it's cold, if your temperature, body temperature is not uh, absolute zero, which is the coldest you can get when all energy stops, thermal energy your body's going to be losing uh, radiant energy. But it can also be gaining it from the environment. So this is a plus or minus. You can gain or lose. Conduction is contact. If you contact an object that has a different temperature, he is going to be transferred. And it's always from higher to lower. So if something feels warm to you, that object is hotter and the energy is moving into your hand, for example. If it feels colder, then you're losing heat to that object. But that's called conduction and it can be gained or lost by the body. Conduction is going to be heat transfer in a fluid, and fluids include uh, gases and liquids. So if you're out in a strong cold wind, that strong cold wind is going to strip that heat from you, and that's called convection. If the wind is very hot, hotter than your body temperature, then it's going to transfer heat to you. Uh, and so this can be plus or minus. In fact, they have ovens called convection ovens where they, they, they blow the air around in there and it causes the, the, the food to cook more evenly and more fast or faster. Uh, and then we have ev evaporation. And evaporation is always going to be a loss. Anytime water evaporates, it takes heat with it, right? So it takes heat energy to cause the water to evaporate. So these are ways you can transfer from the environment Here's a picture of a moose just showing some of the positive gains and negatives. Uh, so we have radiant energy from the sun, um, even reflecting off of the, the ground and the waters. That's all that's being absorbed by the animal here. We have evaporation. That's a heat loss. Convection, perhaps it's a colder wind taking heat away. And you can see that this body of this moose is actually, with this arrow, radiating 
uh, heat in the form of infrared. So uh, the body uh, itself, regardless of the day, is always going to be radiating some of that heat in the form of in, uh, electromagnetic radiation. So looking at ectotherms, ectotherms are going to be uh, organisms that uh, basically their body temperature is connected to the external environment. So it's incorrect to call them cold-blooded because if it's a warm day and the air temperature is warm, then their body temperature is going to be warmer. It's not going to be cold, right? So, uh, But these ectotherms do have an ability to actually change their temperature when it compares to the air temperature of the environment. They can do so behaviorally. For example, lizards can warm up by moving out into the sun and absorbing that radiant energy. They do it in the morning to warm up to get to, uh, so their muscles can work efficiently to both get uh, their food and be able to escape predators. And this moth here shows another example where behaviorally they'll contract their muscles, their ectotherms. And it shows time in minutes down here. So we start at time zero when the moth is thinking about starting to fly. His body temperature is below 25 degrees. Uh, and then the moth starts to contract muscles in the thorax area. Remember uh, the head and an insect, the thorax here, these are muscles associated with flight uh, and other muscles in there. And muscles contracting generate heat. So the, the moth begins to contract muscle, uh, muscles which start to generate heat. And that heat is increasing over just under a two minute period, a little over a minute. And eventually, the entire body is warmed up where flight is efficient for the animal. So here, behavioral regulation. Uh, lizard going out. Into the, by the way, if the lizard gets too hot, what are they going to do? They're going to move into the shade uh, so that they can uh, stop heating up too much. That's behavior. For endotherms, like mammals and ourselves, the endotherms, the uh, origin of the heat is internal. Uh, so uh, we generate a lot of metabolic heat and... Uh, well, um, I must, uh, I'm going I'm to move ahead over here. Uh, being able to do that and maintain your, maintain a certain constant temperature there, uh, that's going to be able to allow for sustained activity. So we don't have to wait for our muscles to warm up. They're always at that optimum temperature to work, or work better than if we were 15 degrees cooler or 10 degrees cooler. Uh, and so then your digestion is more efficient and other things are more efficient. However, maintaining that metabolic heat does require uh, energy. So there's a trade-off there. It costs to maintain your body temperature, but you can work more efficiently at doing things. So there's this trade-off. Now, the endotherm is going to have heat transfer and lost from the environment as well. And the question for the endotherm is, do we need to lose heat because we've gotten too hot or do we need to conserve heat because we are getting too cold, right? So the endotherm has to be active in trying to maintain their body temperature within a certain range so that they can work efficiently. And there's, again, the trade-off for that, right? So um, uh, the, the, this is an active process besides the fact that running that metabolism costs energy, it also costs some energy to try to regulate to make sure you maintain that certain body temperature, right? So, uh, and there are both physiological mechanisms uh, in which you kick up your metabolism or bring it down. There's also some structural features within uh, animals like vertebrates. Uh, and uh, this has to do with uh, how they send blood to the surface to lose heat. Uh, or gain heat. And one of them, especially the, for animals that might live in colder regions or be in uh, liquids that are, are flowing and are going to strip a lot of heat from them, they have structural features within their blood vessels that allow for what's called counter current exchange. And so, there, when the heart's uh, beating in your core where you're maintaining that normal body temperature, when that blood leaves and goes out to the end of your limbs, like your arms out here, there's a lot of surface area to lose heat. And if, let's say you're a whale or a bird and your body, your limbs are in this water, you can lose a lot of heat to that water. But what do you do? You set up your veins to catch because the, the, the blood goes out and arteries going out. Let's see, look at a diagram here. Okay. 
So let's say the inside the animal's core here where the heart is, all the vital organs, is inside the blubber. The blubber is there at the surface where the skin is. That heart is going to pump blood to the limb out here. To the flipper. There's bones in there just like our bones. Right? This is a mammal. So you send that blood out there, and it's going to take heat with it. And we don't want to lose that heat. So as that blood is coming out in the artery, there are veins going, taking blood that was already out on, the, on that limb, taking it back into the core. Uh, but that blood has been cold because it's been out here at the end where the water's cold. But as that blood is returning in, in, uh, in the veins, those veins are going right near the arteries and those veins are picking up the heat. Remember, heat always transfers from warm to cold. So that cold blood is coming back right near the arteries and it's picking up the heat. And that's called countercurrent exchange. So just as a diagram, it's uh, illustration here, coming from the heart over here, the whale's heart, that blood is going towards the end of the limb to the end of the flipper. It starts off warm at 35 degrees Celsius, which is like our body, roughly our body temperature. As it's coming out here, it has some veins right near it that are going to pick up the heat. And the, the blood in there is going back the other way, so that's a counter current. And it's coming back cold from out here, right? So basically the heat coming from the core is going to be taken back by that cooler blood before we lose all that heat to the environment. So this is called counter current exchange. This illustration doesn't do that good a job of showing that, but technically that's what they're trying to say. By the time that blood returns back, it's been warmed up by the outgoing blood. So by the time the outgoing blood gets to the end of the limb, it's not really losing as much heat to the environment. Instead, it's giving it back to the blood coming back. That's called counter current exchange. So this diagram here is showing a cross section uh, through that limb, through that flipper of the whale, and it shows how these veins are all around that artery. So those veins are taking blood back to the core, and they're picking up that heat. Those little arrows show that heat being transferred back to the blood. That's called countercurrent exchange, and it's a way to conserve heat, and it's just the way evolution has designed these things so that uh, uh, they conserve heat. Now, body size uh, is important. The smaller you are, the more easily you transfer heat to the environment and the more easily you gain heat from the environment. The larger you are, the harder it is to have heat transfer because there's so much volume in there and so little surface area. It's just like the surface area to volume ratios with cells that we learned back in uh, the chapter on cells, probably chapter four of uh, your biology one course. Same thing with bodies. Larger the body, the less surface area to lose heat. There's so much volume in there, right? So it turns out that um, that there's a relationship between body mass and metabolic rate. Smaller organisms are going to consume much more energy per, um, per unit of body mass. And that means pound for pound. The smaller animal, like a mouse, is going to use a lot more energy per gram of weight than a larger animal will. So, but the larger animal overall is going to absolutely use more energy, but it's just pound for pound, gram for gram, the smaller organism uses much more energy. So uh, they have to constantly be eating and taking in energy just to keep that meta met metabolic rate up. Uh, so here's the uh, mouse elephant curve, and it's not a linear curve. Uh, it shows that would show something like this. So here, this would be your... Uh, metabolism, and you graph it against the mass of the animal, uh, and it's, it's, it's showing here that the smaller you are, the more your met metabolic rate is, and the, the larger you are, the more. It's not going to be linear like this. Uh, so that's what this part is saying right here. Instead, it's a curve, and not only that, uh, in order to kind of keep track of this, they need to take the logarithm of the mass because there's such a wide range of masses from little tiny shoes, which are really, really tiny to elephants that weigh a uh, thousand or more kilograms uh, to over here to hundredths of a, of a kilogram. So they use a log base 10 scale. So each unit here uh, changes by a factor of 10. You can't do that on a linear scale. If you start going by ones, you need to keep going by ones. But here they're changing. As we go from this unit to this unit, we're now going by a factor of 10 greater and then a factor of 10 greater. So you're actually changing. Is like you start off going by 10, and then the next unit, now you're going by 100, and then by 1,000, you're changing your scale, but you're doing it 
by going by converting to a log scale, and that allows you to fit a wide range of values there. Over here, your metabolic rate is going to be represented as milliliters of oxygen used, because using oxygen is how you you can burn your your energy nutrients like glucose to make ATP. And it says milliliters of oxygen if you read the scale, and then it says grams to the negative one times hours to the negative one. To the negative one is like saying put it over the number. So that's like saying milliliters of oxygen per gram per hour. Okay, so that's the same thing. So here you're comparing how much oxygen gram per gram for each one. And what you can see here is the shrew for each gram of body mass uses seven milliliters of oxygen. But if you come over here to something like a mouse, between a mouse and a squirrel, they're only using one gram of, I mean, one milliliter of oxygen for every gram of body mass. Uh, so it's all relative, right? Overall, the larger animals are going to use more energy, but pound for pound, gram for gram, the smaller animals have a much higher metabolic rate. So they're quick, they're active, and they're constantly having to gain energy, uh, and there's trade-offs there. They probably have a shorter lifespan. Um, they live life uh, quickly, and they, but they've got to be keep obtaining energy or have other kinds of adaptations that allow them uh, to survive uh, despite their energy needs. So uh, those are some things that they do. Now, when it comes to these mammals overall, the thermal regulation uh, is going to be controlled by the hypothalamus uh, that was already mentioned. There's the control centers in there. There's going to be receptors there in the brain that communicate, they give this information to the hypothalamus and say the hypothalamus determines is it too hot, too cold, or just right. Uh, so if... Uh, Let's say the body, the core body temperature has gone too high, then the hypothalamus is going to uh, send information to the effectors like blood vessels uh, to get them to dilate. So we send more blood to the surface and then sweat glands to begin sweating. Uh, if the opposite is true, let's say that you've gotten too cold, then the hypothalamus is going to direct uh, thermogenesis. We're also going to constrict blood vessels so we don't lose heat to the outside. We're going to keep the blood underneath the layer of fat, keep it more in the, to the core. And then we're going to get things like the thyroid gland. Uh, the pituitary is going to release thyroid stimulating hormone. That stimulates the thyroid to release the hormones to pick up your metabolism. Uh, and we're going to get muscles to start to shiver. Uh, and that's going to generate heat to bring the body temperature back up. So this is so, shown in a diagram here. This is actually inside the brain. Uh, right here. Uh, this is the back of the brain. You may have seen pictures of the brain. So the front of the brain is out of here. There's the cerebral cortex, the temporal lobe, uh, the occipital lobe back here. The person would be facing over here. This would be the front uh, over here. Uh, and then back here would be the cerebellum, and then here would be the brain stem, like this. Okay. And all this is inside your cranium, uh, and your eyes would be out of here toward the front uh, of your skull overall. Now, if I were to cut into the brain and look inside right there, that's approximately where this box is. So we're looking inside the brain at this area here. And here you have your sensory receptors, your thermal receptors that then are going to communicate and give information to your integrating centers in the hypothalamus here. This is your pituitary gland, by the way, which was mentioned earlier. And so here, if you're in the sun, you're going to warm up. If you're in snow, you're going to get too cold in here. We just go through that same negative feedback path we were seeing earlier. Body temperature rises, you got your thermoreceptors, your hypothalamus integrates, and we follow the top arrow here. The effectors, the blood vessels dilate, the, the sweat glands start releasing sweat, that causes you to cool off, and then your hypothalamus is sensing this. Have we gotten back to normal body temperature yet or not? If not, we're going to keep doing this until we do, and that brings your body temperature back down. If you get too cold because you're in the snow, body temperature drops. Those same receptors are going to uh, uh, communicate with the integrating centers, the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus says, getting too cold, what are we going to do? We're going to go down this path. The effector is going to constrict blood vessels, and we're going to contract muscles to get them to shiver. And then temperature starts to rise. This will continue until the hypothalamus says we're back to normal. Okay, so... A couple other topics, though, when it comes to those animals and their metabolic rates. If you're a very tiny animal, one adaptation is to go into torpor. Let's say at night you're a diurnal bird or a small mammal, 
and uh, you can't forage, you can't go looking for things to eat, so you can't feed that metabolism. So what do you do? You're going to lower your body temperature. So torpor is a decrease in the body temperature, say overnight. Uh, and you decrease it by 20, 25 degrees Celsius, that lowers your metabolic rate to allow you to not have to be looking for food all the time and rest during the evening and then bring your body temperature back up. This is typical for small mammals. And then there's hibernation, which uh, is more for mid-sized mammals. Bears do not hibernate. And this is going to be an extended period of time. Uh, in which they lower their body temperature, maybe 20 degrees, and then uh, their body mass is much bigger, so they're not losing as much energy, uh, heat to the internal environment. So a combination of factors overall will let them ride out uh, a long period of time without eating. Bears don't hibernate, though. So these are uh, some things discussed there at the end. And one other item is discover, uh, discussed is fever. And a fever overall is when the animal... Uh, this hypothalamus gets reset to a higher temperature. And so now your body, your hypothalamus, the control center is now keeping your body temperature at a higher than normal level. And this is in response to pyrogens. Pyro means fire. And a pyrogen are going to be molecules that uh, interact with that hypothalamus and get it to reset to a higher temperature, and that generates fever. This fever is thought to be adaptive because certain bacteria may not grow better at higher temperature is also going to uh, allow your immune system to work more efficiently at a higher temperature. So overall, the fever is adaptive and beneficial to help you fight infection. However, too high a temperature can be lethal. So it has to be monitored, but fever might be good.